Okay, so let's start this workshop. And the first speaker, it is really great pleasure to have Matt Hedrick from Brandeis, and he will tell us about uh, covariant bit rates, min max surfaces, and entropy inequalities. Please start. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much, Tadashi, for inviting me uh, to give a talk. And thanks to everyone who's, who, who's attending. I know that this is a, especially for people in Japan, it's extremely late at night. So I'm grateful that you, that you chose to spend this time watching my talk. Um, uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, goes back to work that Tadashi did in 2007 actually all the way back to 2006 with the Ryu Takenagi formula, but today I'm more specifically talking about the Hubini Rangamani Takenagi formula or HRT, um, which is a formula that gives us the entanglement entropy in a holographic uh, theory without making assumptions about being, on a, being in a static state, which the original Ryu Takenagi formula made. And so that formula, that HRT formula was written down by Tadashi, Veronica, and Mukund in 2007. Um, and we're still learning new things about it and we're still learning new things from it. Uh, for example, all the recent work about the page curve and quantum extremal surfaces you know, comes out of the HRT formula. Um, and so that work has to do with quantum corrections. Today, I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm just gonna be talking about the classical HRT formula. Um, uh, because there's still things we don't know about the classical HRT formula. Um, uh, so let me just say a couple words, you know, of, of, um, about the structure of the talk. Well, first of all, let me apologize for the, um, for the scrawl uh, that I put here um, uh, in, my, uh, in my talk. Um, it's not very, uh, it's not, um, uh, the 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 slides are not very pretty. I apologize for that. It's just we're in the middle of exam period, so I didn't have time to write up a nice set of slides. But the more important thing is, I hope you can read my handwriting. If there's anything you can't read or you don't understand, um, either because of the handwriting or just because I haven't explained the physics, please uh, stop me at any time. Um, it doesn't really matter that much whether I get to the end of my talk. It's much more important for people to understand what I've said. So please feel free to interrupt me with any kind of question at any time. Um, so, um, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, basically playing around with the HRT formula and trying to understand it better from different viewpoints. Okay. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do um, uh, and this is work in progress I'm doing with Veronica and also my student at Brandeis, Guillermo Grimaldi. Um, so I'm gonna rewrite the HRT formula in a few, diff few new ways. Um, and um, already it, it, it's been known for a, for a long time now, thanks to work by Aaron Wall from 2012 that rewriting the HRT formula gives us new insights. And so I'm gonna rewrite it in, in, a, in a bunch of new ways. Um, and the new ways, um, there are basically two types. One is in terms of surfaces, which is how the original HRT formula was written, and then in terms of bit threads. Um, so some of this talk will be about bit threads, which is a subject that I've written and given a lot of talks about. And in this, so when I give talks about bit threads, I usually talk about the conceptual implications and so on. I'm not going to focus on that in this talk. It's going to be more technical. It's going to be about the mathematics that makes bit threads work um, in this setting. Um, and then I'm going to, using one of the new formulations of, um, of the HRT formula, I'm going to talk about entropy inequalities. Um, uh, let me say that uh, um, I, I can change the size of this. So Tadashi and I discussed what the ideal size was. So this is probably too small and this is probably too big. So, but if, if it's too small and you can't read what I've written, um, just let me know, I can easily change it or zoom in on something or whatever. Okay, so, um, uh, so the basic setting here is um, ADS-CFT and I'm not gonna be going beyond ADS-CFT. I'm not gonna be talking about flat space holography or de Sitter or cosmology. And all of those things are very interesting to talk about, but we still don't really understand entanglement entropy that well just in 
regular EDSCFT. And I, like I said, it's just classical uh, general relativity we're dealing with. So we have, um, you know, we have the bulk space time, which I'll call M. And then, you know, of course we have the boundary and, um, uh, and we're fixing a certain boundary region A, um, which is, you know, which is on a time slice on the boundary. So I have a boundary time slice, which would go around like this. And then a part of that is my region A. And on the boundary, that, that region has a domain of dependence D of A. And its complement, which is this uh, um, region uh, on the other side, it has its domain of dependence D of A complement. And so we can actually decompose. So I'll be using this um, notation a lot in the talk. So we can decompose the full boundary of the space time uh, into four parts. So we have the, the domain of dependence of A, the domain of dependence of its complement, the future part, which also includes if there's a singularity or, or just future infinity, um, and the past part, uh, which also includes past infinity or there's a singularity. Okay, so we have a decomposition of the boundary of M into these four parts, I, and I call the future uh, I plus and the past I minus. And here's another cartoon because I'll be using two different cartoons. Um, so you can imagine M as being, for example, a, a, a multi-boundary wormhole or something like that. And then D of A, so let me actually just draw because I, I, I realized I didn't draw. A itself would be sort of a, you know, a time slice here and A complement would be a time slice here. And there, um, the domain, domain of dependence in this setting would be one entire conformal boundary connected component. And the A complement would be another connected component. And, um, and then we would have the future singularity and the past singularity. So these are just two cartoons, but what I'm talking about is general. It could include a multi-boundary wormhole where the region A is just a part of one boundary or includes several different connected components, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but my drawing skills are somewhat limited. So I'll stick to this kind of either Penrose diagram type of thing or soup can type of thing. Um, okay, so that's the notation. And um, the original HRT uh, formula is in terms of the air, it gives the entanglement entropy of A in terms of a, uh, the area of an extremal surface. And then Aaron Wall um, uh, reformulated it in terms of the maximum formula. <coughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so we need some more notation. Um, like I said, um, you know, if you have any general questions about the HRT formula or something, feel free to stop me. Um, okay, so max, how does maximum work? We need to understand that to get more into the details here. Um, so first of all, we, we consider uh, bulk Cauchy slices. So little sigma I'm, is denotes a bulk Cauchy slice. Um, and um, uh, it has to, the ones that we're interested in, if we're interested in some region A on the boundary, have to be such that their intersection with the boundary includes the entangling surface. So DA here is, um, uh, this is the entangling surface. And in my cartoon, this entangling surface is the boundary of A here in the cartoon, it would just be these two points. And the Cauchy slice has to contain the entangling surface. Okay, so we're only interested in Cauchy slices that contain the entangling surface. Given a Cauchy slice that contains the entangling surface, it intersects with the boundary domain of dependence on some, um, on, on some boundary region, which is a Cauchy slice for the boundary domain of dependence. Okay, and I'll call that A sub sigma. So A sub sigma is the intersection of sigma with the boundary domain of dependence of A. And then to do maximum, we want to consider bulk surfaces uh, that are homologous to, um, to A sub sigma uh, and its relative homology. If, if you're not familiar with relative homology, it's not that crucial, but basically this implies that um, the, the surface gamma, um, which is a bulk co-dimension two surface, meets the boundary or is anchored on the entangling surface. Okay, so when I say surface, um, uh, I always mean um, surface, I always mean a space-like 
uh, co-dimension to a submanifold. Okay, so my 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 entangling surface is a space like co-dimension two submanifold on the boundary, and gamma is a bulk surface which is a space like co-dimension two surface in the bulk. So, um, for so for any particular bulk slice sigma, I have a family of such surfaces that are allowed. Um, so this here is the homology constraint that gamma has to be homologous to a sub sigma. And now what I do, okay, so I denote the area of a surface by absolute value. And for a given bulk Cauchy slice sigma, I minimize the surface area uh, among surfaces that are homologous to A. And then I maximize over the choice of um, bulk Cauchy slice. Okay, so that's Aaron Wall's um, uh, maximin uh, from I think 2012 um, formula. Okay, so um, uh, now in this formula, we kind of treat space and time differently. So we consider variations in, this, in the space direction in this minimization step and variations in the time direction in the maximization step where we are allowing the Cauchy slice to move up and down in time, okay? And so it looks like we should be able to treat these things kind of on the same footing. Uh, and so what we want to do is we want to make that more manifest, um, uh, basically to eliminate the dependence in the minimization step on the choice of bulk Cauchy slice. So we have a more symmetrical formula, okay? Um, so um, to do that, we define a new notion, which is a timesheet. Um, so, um, uh, so this is going to be basically a time-like analog of a Cauchy slice, okay? So what is a timesheet um, for a given region A? A timesheet is an everywhere time-like or null hypersurface, um, which obeys a certain homo space-time homology condition. So now instead of, this was a spatial homology condition, meaning that there's a spatial region in the bulk that interpolates between gamma and a sub sigma. Now we're going to be talking about a space-time homology condition where we have a, 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 a hypersurface, tau, which is homologous to um, a co-dimension one um, uh, submanifold, which is d of a. So again, I have this boundary causal diamond, d of a, and I want tau to be homologous to d of a, relative to all the rest of the boundary. So I don't care about this I plus, I don't care about this I minus, uh, but basically tau has to um, uh, be homologous to D of A, which forces it actually to intersect the boundary on the entangling surface. So you notice that my timesheet tau, where it intersects the boundary, it goes through the entangling surface, okay? And that makes it a timesheet for A, okay? Um, okay, so, um, and here's a, another cartoon of this uh, in the sort of wormhole setting where here I have my D of A and D of A complement and tau is a time-like hypersurface which is a homologous to D of A relative to all of this stuff. We don't care about this stuff. So there's a space-time homology region which interpolates between tau and d of a. Okay, so these timesheets are gonna be very important in what I do um, going forward. So if, if there's any questions about what a timesheet is or the definition, please let me know. Um, uh, okay, so um, now the thing is, what I, what I wanna do is I want to talk about surfaces gamma. So you recall we were talking about surfaces on a given Cauchy slice that are homologous to A. And so I just wanna say, given such a surface, you can find a timesheet um, such that that surface is the intersection with tau and sigma. So given, or maybe I should say this first, actually, given a slice sigma and a timesheet tau, they intersect on a co-dimension to space-like surface, which is necessarily homologous to uh, A sub sigma, okay? So for any timesheet tau and for any uh, Cauchy slice sigma, the intersection is a surface homologous to A. So it's in this class of surfaces, okay? And um, uh, conversely, 
given a surface in this class, there exists a time sheet uh, such that the intersection of that time sheet with sigma is gamma. So now what we can do, given this lemma, is we can forget about surfaces and we can just talk about time sheets. Okay, so we can rewrite maximin. So this is the same formula, but now in the, the supremization, the maximization step is the same, but the minimization step, I've thrown away the surfaces and replaced them with time sheets. And then the area that I look at is the area of their intersection. So this gamma intersect tau, as this sig sorry, this sigma intersect tau is gamma, okay? And the idea with this uh, rewriting it this way is that now I can talk about, I can think about switching the order of the minimization and the maximization, okay? Because here I can't even talk about switching the order because you see the minimization, the set of things over which I'm minimizing depends on the choice of slice. Right, but now the set of things over which I'm minimizing doesn't depend on the choice of slice. Okay, so that just gives us a little bit more freedom. Okay, and so the question is, you know, can we switch the order of the minimization and maximization? Do we have that freedom? And so it leads to the question in general, if you have a function of two variables and you're minimizing on one variable, maximizing on the other, can you switch the order or not? Okay, and there's a whole, um, theory about that called minimax theory, which actually was invented by the same guy who wrote down the entropy formula uh, von Neumann. So this guy von Neumann, he, you can't get away from him. Um, he actually invented this in, in his later years when he was trying, when he invented game theory. And in game theory, in very simple games, uh, simple two person games, um, the question of whether the minimax equals the maximin uh, determines how the game goes. Because basically one player, you know, if, if the payout that I get in a game depends on how I play and how you play, and I'm trying to maximize my payout and you're trying to minimize my payout, you're doing a minimization over your variables. I'm doing a maximization over my variables. And the question is, does it matter who plays first? And if it matters who plays first, you know, if, if, if I can do better by playing second, uh, because I know what you've played when I decide what I played, uh, then the maximum is not equal to the minimax. But if it doesn't matter, then the maximum is equal to the minimax. So, um, uh, so an example of this, at least in the US, I don't know if this is in Japan and the other countries where you guys are, but there's a children's game called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Um, and in Rock, Paper, Scissors, uh, they're, they're there are two kids and each kid has to decide whether they play rock or paper or scissors and then there are rules about who wins. And the thing is that it's very important in this game that both players play at the same time. Because if I wait to see what you've played to decide what I've played, I can always win 100% of the time. And so there's a rule that says that the two children have to play at the same time, otherwise it's not fair, okay? And so that's basically a very simple example of a two person game where the minimax and the maximin are not the same. Okay, so the question is in this setting, is the uh, minimax equal to the maximin, okay? And let, let's, let me just make a few general comments about that. Um, so the first comment, which you can easily convince yourself of, is that um, uh, regardless of, without putting any conditions on the function, so I have this function from uh, x times y to, to the real numbers, and I'm minimizing over the X variable and I'm maximizing over the Y variable. And the question is um, which one I'm doing first, whether I'm first doing the maximization and then the minimization or the other way around. And it, no matter what, without it putting any conditions on the set X, the set Y or the function F, you can show that this, that um, if you maximize first, the result you get is necessarily at least as big as if you minimize first. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but are they equal? Well, they're not necessarily equal. And I gave an example with rock, paper, scissors where they're not equal. And you can, make, you can easily make an example where they're not equal. And the whole subject of minimax theory is to find uh, conditions to, to prove theorems giving conditions under which they are equal, okay? Um, uh, and uh, let me give two examples of such conditions, um, which are, um, well, the first one is really very simple. 
Um, so if there's a if there's a a a, a pair of points x not y not, um, which it guarantees um, uh, that you have minimized fixing y, minimized with respect to x fixing y, and maximized with respect to y fixing x, then necessarily uh, this minimax is and this maximum are both equal to f of x not y not. It's very easy. I'm not going to go through the, the reasoning, but it's if you just spend a couple of minutes, you can easily convince yourself of this. Um, so if you can prove that there exists what, what I call a global saddle point, then, um, then the minimax equals the maximum. Um, there's another condition. So von Neumann's original theorem on this subject um, concerned what are called mixed strategy games. So in a mixed strategy game, you get to put down a probability distribution rather than making up your mind at the beginning about which strategy you're going to play. Um, so for example, in rock, paper, scissors, you could say, I'm going to play probability one third rock, one third paper, one third scissors. And then if I say that, then it doesn't really matter what you play. Uh, you have no advantage, even if you play second, it gives you no advantage to know that I've decided to play that strategy. So if you have, if you allow these probabilistic strategies uh, or what are called mixed strategies, then it eliminates the advantage of playing second, which is to say it, it, elimin it makes the minimax equal the maximum. Okay, and more generally, if, this, if the space X is a convex set um, and the function uh, is, um, uh, is convex in the variable that you're minimizing on and concave in the variable you're maximizing on, then, um, then the minimax equals the maximum. So this was von Neumann's original, actually his original theorem was a little more limited than this, but it was soon generalized. Um, and actually this, I have not written out the full theorem. There's other conditions. Um, uh, you need a compactness condition and, and, and especially if you move to infinite dimensions, then it starts getting complicated and there's a whole area of analysis about this. But for our purposes as physicists, I think we're just gonna use um, this, uh, statement that if you have convex sets and if your function is concave convex, meaning it's convex in the variable you're doing the minimization on and concave in the variable you're doing the maximization on, then the minimax equals the maximum. Okay, so we're going to use these two uh, sufficient conditions for equality. Let, let me just pause for a second if there are any questions. So any questions about the HRT formula, about maximum, about timesheets, or about minimax theory so far. So can I ask a question about your final point? So yeah. usually extremal su surface satisfy this global saddle point condition. If we go so, in I mean, the time like direction, it uh, gets uh, I mean, smaller, but if we go to space like direction, it usually gets larger. Right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that next. So I'm gonna apply these two to this thing to ask whether I can switch the order of minimization and maximization. And yes, the extremal surface will, I, I, yeah. So first I'm gonna apply this one. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna apply this one. Ah, uh -huh. I see, I see. Yes. Also this global structure is important if we think some black holes then there are singularity in future. Yeah, yeah the singularity is fine, um, but it doesn't count in the homology condition. So um, like here, for example, um, so here, here I have a, a singularity mm. in the future, oh, a singularity in the past. Yeah. Um, and um, my timesheet tau is homologous to D of A relative to the singularity, which means that there's a region that interpolates, a space-time region that interpolates between them. Now you might say that space-time region has another boundary, which is this, and this, mm -hmm, but yeah. when I say that if you have relative homology, um, that means you don't care about those. The singularity doesn't count uh -huh. as far uh -huh. as the homology condition is concerned. So, so how can we justify that? It's, is it I mean, come from some comparison and entanglement entropy or why you can neglect this black hole singularity as homology constraint? Well, um, uh, 
basically, um, I, I think the way to think about it, or one way to think about it, is that um, if you want the time, see, in general, assuming you have, you consider a pure state. So then you have this idea of complementarity where, where the space-time region associated to A complement is the complement of the space-time region associated to A. Now, um, uh, so what we want, we want, what we want the timesheet tau to do is to um, divide the space-time into one part belonging to A and one part belonging to, to A complement. And you can't do that unless you basically, you know, don't count the singularity. So this is slightly different. You might have said, oh, you know, I want the entanglement wedge, you know, and so I'm going to have an entanglement wedge, which is like this for A and one which is like this for A complement. But here we want, we actually want the whole space time. Um, we're not dividing the space time into wedges. Mm -hmm. We actually want the whole space time to be divided into these two uh, parts. Um, so it's, it's a slightly, maybe slightly unfamiliar viewpoint, but you're going to see that it, that everything works out great. And in fact, it's, it's going to be very important that we, um, that we allow this, but yeah, we, you should, you should keep paying attention to that. That's yeah, important. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I, I realized that I, um, uh, can I ask uh, as a point of notation, um, I, I should say, I should explain my notation a little bit better. I forgot to say this, that- um, Can I ask you a question? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, are these uh, the two conditions you show in below are a necessary and sufficient condition? No, these are just sufficient conditions. Sufficient, okay. Yeah, e each, one, each one is a sufficient condition. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, and there are much, much weaker conditions that um, that that are also sufficient. So th these are not the weakest conditions that are sufficient, and and it's a very even today mathematicians write theorems where they weaken these conditions and and consider all kinds of interesting things. Um, uh, so um, especially in the infinite dimensional case. Um, which is where we will be working because obviously all of these, um, you know, we have infinite dimensionals, you know, the, the space of Cauchy slices and so on is infinite dimensional, et cetera. But we're gonna put aside all the analysis here and proceed naively. Uh, so we still don't know the necessary and sufficient condition. Well, I mean, unless I don't, I don't know, um, yeah, there might be some expressions of necessary conditions, but somehow that's, I think that's less interesting than having, um, yeah, I'm not sure. They, 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 mathematicians really focus more on sufficient conditions in this case. Okay. Um, I haven't thought very much about necessary conditions because, I mean, I, I think it could, well, I don't know. I think it could happen that somehow just by accident, these things are equal without being a, there being a real reason for it. Um, but, and let me say one other thing, by the way, in fact, the theorems, mostly that what the theorems do is they reduce some conditions to this one. So in fact, even this one, the way you prove it is by showing that it implies this actually. So in the end, in the end, it really all comes down to the existence of a global saddle point. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, just as a matter of notation, since these timesheets are very important, um, I have a notation for the set of timesheets, which is this T sub A. Actually, this is a this is actually a capital tau, but I guess a capital tau is indistinguishable from a T. So, um, so that's the set on which we're we're doing the minimization. Okay. So, um, uh, so. Let us um, uh, switch the order um, and do the, the, the maximization first and then the minimization. And I'm going to give this um, a name S plus. And, and by the way, um, 
I, I should have said this, but um, the maximum quantity I called S minus, and I'll see, I'll, I'll show you why it's called S minus in a minute. Um, so um, uh, S plus is, um, uh, is defined again as the area of the intersection where you first maximize over the choice of, uh, of, of slice and then minimize over the choice of time sheet, which I can now rewrite in a, in a way that's more analogous to, maxim, to the original maximum, where for each time sheet, I maximize the area of a, an achronal surface inside that given time sheet. So gamma sub tau is the set of all achronal surfaces inside of a given time sheet. And then I'm maximizing the area of the achronal surface. Um, now, by this inequality, um, sorry, by this inequality, we know that the minimax is greater than or equal to the maximum without knowing anything more. I mean, that's just completely automatic. Um, and that's why I called the minimax S plus and the maximum S minus. And the question is, are they necessarily equal? Um, so first I'm gonna show a counterexample where they're not equal. However, the counterexample is not physical. And then I'm gonna talk about more physical, when, what happens when you put more physical situation, um, conditions on your space time, okay? So uh, my counterexample is the following. Um, uh, so I have some kind of, this is, think of this as like a Penrose diagram. It's like, it's like these Penrose diagrams, but it's, it's a rectangle where it's, it's taller than it is wide. And I have a stripe. And, and the, so there's a sphere, which is, you know, in the Penrose diagram, so every point there's a sphere and the sphere has area A minus in this region and in this region, and it has area A plus in, on the stripe where A plus is more than A minus. And so then if you make a time, if you make a Cauchy slice going across, so if you do, if you do maximum, you pick a Cauchy slice and then you look for the minimal area, it's A minus. And that means that the maximum quantity is equal to A minus, okay? So any Cauchy slice the, crosses the A minus region and therefore the minimal area on that slice is A minus, therefore the maximum is A minus. On the other hand, if you look at a time sheet, every time sheet crosses this A plus area, so the maximal uh, achronal surface area on the, on, a, on the time sheet is A plus, okay? And therefore the minimax quantity is A plus. So the maximum is A minus and the minimax is A plus and they're not equal, okay? Of course, they obey this inequality, um, but, um, uh, but they're not equal. So that shows that it's not necessarily the case that the maximum equals, that the minimax equals the maximum. However, um, this example is not physical because um, it doesn't, at least as a holographic space time, you can see, for example, it violates the null energy condition, which you can see by starting from a surface here and sending out a null light ray, the area increases, so it's not focusing. Um, it doesn't have ADS boundary conditions and so on. Um, it violates, for example, the gau wald theorem. I mean, this side can see this side and so on, okay? So it's not physical. So if we impose physical conditions, then um, we get a much nicer result so the physical conditions that I want to impose are the usual ones we impose for classical holographic space times, um, namely the null energy condition and ADS boundary conditions. Okay, and then if you find your HRT surface, then um, uh, that of course is under those conditions that is also the maximum surface, um, which means it's minimal on its slice, but at the same time, it's maximal on the entanglement horizon. And here I, I should have included a picture. So let me just quickly draw a little picture. Um, so, um, uh, so I have my HRT surface, which is somewhere. And then I have my entanglement horizon, which is like this. And uh, although in this picture, this, this um, looks like it's not, it's not null. Actually, locally, the entanglement horizon, which is the boundary of the entanglement wedge, is everywhere null or um, or 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 time-like. And actually, it doesn't have to look. Let me redraw it because that looks. That's not the most general case. It, it will generally meet the 
um, singularity. So anyway, so you have your entanglement horizon, which is itself a time sheet homologous to D of A. Um, and, um, uh, and on that entanglement horizon, the HRT surface by virtue of the null energy condition is maximal, right? Because if I shoot out these null rays, they're focusing. And so they, the area decreases along here, it decreases along here. And so the HRT surface is maximal on the entanglement horizon. So that means that the HRT surface is both the maximum and the minimax surface, which means it's a global saddle. And the existence of a global saddle implies that the maximum and minimax equal uh, are equal to each other and to that area. Okay, so once we impose some physical conditions, then the maximum and the minimax collapse into the quantity, which is just the HRT area. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, so that's that's great because that means that actually we now have a new formula which is equivalent to HRT. And um, uh, what can we do with that formula? Um, can we do anything new? So now I'm going to show you entropy inequalities using minimax. Okay, let me pause for questions. Okay, so I'm, I'm realizing given the time, I'm not going to get to the last part of my talk, but that's okay. The last part of my talk is about bit threads, but that's fine. Um, uh, okay, so entropy inequalities using minimax. So we know by virtue of Aaron Wall's work that by using maximum, you can prove um, important inequalities like strong subadditivity and the MMI inequality um, using maximum. So let's just go through the exercise and see how we would prove uh, inequalities like that using minimax. Um, and then I'll show you something new or I'll tell you something new. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're proving strong subadditivity, which obviously has already been proved using maximum, but the idea is just to get some new point of view, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna prove strong subadditivity and the way the proof works is very different from the way it works in maximum, okay? So now the, the pictures get complicated um, and my ability to draw is still limited. Um, so I have these three boundary regions, A, B, and C. And by the way, I mean, let's just get the inequality up on the board. So we're very interested in um, these four entropies. And um, uh, in the proof using maximum, by the way, what you do is you, you, you look at the surfaces for these and you project them onto a time slice, which contains the surfaces for these, the HRT surfaces for the right-hand side. We're gonna do something slightly different. So this is, what I did in this diagram is I got rid of the boundary. So this is a soup can diagram, but to try to make it a little bit clearer, I got rid of the boundary and I have a time sheet for AB. So A is gonna be this part of the boundary, B is gonna be this part of the boundary and C is this part. And this is the complement of ABC. So my AB, time sheet is something like this and the bc time sheet is something like this and they cross each other they cut each one cuts the other into two parts so this is like in the usual in the static proof you know it just looks like this where this is uh the ab and this is the bc and they cut each other okay so they cut each other here but now these are space time hypersurfaces and um, so each, each one cuts the other one into two parts. So now I have these partial time sheets, the first part of the AB one, the second part of the AB one, the first part of the BC one, and the second part of the BC one. So the, the, those are these sort of partial time sheets. Okay, now if I re-glue them, if I re-glue the AB, one part of the AB time sheet with one part of the BC time sheet, so if I glue, this partial time sheet to this partial time sheet, I get a time sheet which is uh, homologous to B. Okay, and similarly, if I glue the other part of the AB with the other part of the BC, that's this part with this part, then I get a time, a time sheet which is homologous to ABC. Meanwhile, I have the surfaces, the actual minimax surfaces or HRT surfaces. So I have the AB HRT surface, which is in purple here, and I have the BC 
HRT surface, which is in orange. Those don't necessarily intersect. So I cannot start gluing, cutting and gluing those, okay? But it is true that the AB um, HRT surface is cut into two parts uh, by the BC timesheet. So I have the first part of the AB uh, HRT surface, which is contained in the first partial timesheet and so on. So I have these four partial HRT surfaces, okay? And like I said, I can't just re-glue them. They don't connect up to each other. Um, but now there's a lemma, um, which says, so, so the important thing here is that, so the HRT surfaces are fixed, but the timesheets are not unique. So there's actually a choice of timesheet that contains the HRT surface, just like in Maximin, there's freedom in choosing, in choosing the Cauchy slice uh, given the HRT surface. So there's freedom in choosing these timesheets. And one can show, so I, I should say, first of all, I mean, to some extent, this is work in progress. We haven't crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, but I would say I'm 95% confident that this is all gonna work out. So, um, uh, so um, you can choose the timesheets. You can make use of your freedom to choose the timesheets. Um, uh, with the property that the partial surface, look at this partial surface, is maximal on its partial timesheet, okay? And that the, this partial uh, surface is maximal on its partial timesheet and so on. Okay, so that, so um, because basically, let me just say this again, if I change my BC timesheet, then I am changing how the AB surface gets cut into two pieces. And my claim is that you can choose that BC timesheet such that this, not only is this AB surface, of course, a maximal on the AB timesheet because it's the minimax surface, but a stronger condition that um, this partial surface is maximal on this partial timesheet and the other one also, all four of them. Okay, uh, so th this lemma is basically the heart of the matter. I'll show you once you have this lemma, the rest of the proof goes through very simply. Um, to prove this lemma, what you do is you consider an, an, a global minimax, a global minimax problem where you're simultaneously doing minimax on A, B, and B, C on, on, all, the, on all four parts at the same time. Um, okay, so, but let's say we have this lemma in hand. Um, now, like I told you, we were going to re-glue the timesheets. When I re-glue the timesheet, now I have this timesheet for B, and I can find a maximal surface on this re-glued timesheet. So that's some maximal surface on this thing. And I find a maximal surface on this uh, ABC timesheet. OK, that's so I'll call that gamma tilde. I'll call that gamma tilde. Um, now. Uh, if when I do this union of the partial surfaces, I don't get the gamma tilde because these things don't connect up with each other. So what I'm doing is I'm gluing this purple thing to this orange dotted thing, and you see they don't connect up. On the other hand, gamma tilde is forced to, 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 to connect up. Um, and since here I am, um, so here, when I, when I look at the area of this, I'm maximizing um, uh, subject to the constraint that I have a, an actual acronal surface, which is a stronger condition than I'm using for these guys. So here, this, is, this area is maximized under a weaker constraint than here. So I necessarily have this inequality. Then, uh, meanwhile, this is not the actual HRT surface for B because it's lying on this crazy timesheet, which is made by gluing this timesheet to this timesheet. So this is not the actual B timesheet. So I have another inequality, which says that the real timesheet, so this is a top-down view. So here's the, here's the AB timesheet, here's the BC timesheet. I've re-glued them to make this red 
timesheet. It's not the real one for B, but it's homologous to B. The real one for B is in green. So certainly the real area is less than or equal to this one, this gamma tilde. This gamma tilde is less than or equal to this. So I have these inequalities. Now I just add them to each other and I get um, uh, that I get my inequality. Okay, because of course this, now I just rearrange terms. So from here, the, it, the proof is the same as Tadashi and my proof from 15 years ago um, uh, for the static case. Okay, you just re regroup terms and you get the, um, the, the, the total area of the purple and the orange is the same as the total area of all the partial ones. Uh, and that's the thing that I, that I bounded below with, with this. Um, okay, so, um, so this proof, you know, it looks quite different from Aaron Wall's proof using Maximin. Um, but you notice, so Aaron Wall's proof using Maximin, it required null energy condition, ADS boundary conditions. And here you might say, well, did you use those? Um, and it looks like I didn't use those, but of course I used them in asserting that this, that these, um, that for example, this thing equals this, right? I mean, the minimax formula doesn't make any sense or at least does not calculate the entropy uh, if you don't impose those conditions. So, um, uh, so this, this inequality holds, um, at, as a um, uh, as an inequality on some surface areas, but the surface areas don't necessarily um, uh, they're not equal to entanglement entropies if you're not you know in a real holographic space time. Okay, so I hope you're you're interested in having. I'm always excited to have a new proof of things like strong subadditivity, but you you might be even more interested um, by the following fact that this proof uh, does not get stuck on the higher entropy inequality. So in 2015, Ning Bao and company uh, proved that there exists an infinite number of, um, uh, of further more complicated entropy inequalities beyond those for the, for the RT formula, beyond strong subadditivity and, and the MMI inequality. And so far, no one has proved that those apply to the HRT formula, although there's been a significant amount of study um, uh, trying to prove it or, or trying to see whether it's true or not. And in particular, um, uh, Bartek, Chek, and Shidong proved it in two plus one dimensions. Um, but here we have, a by, by following exactly the same proof and using the same lemma, uh, we can reduce you see, because at the end, this proof ended up being exactly the same as the RT proof. And therefore anything you prove, basically anything you prove that applies um, to the RT formula uh, will work for Minimax. And so that shows, since Minimax gives HRT, that shows that the HRT formula obeys all of the higher entropy inequalities. So to say it differently, if you know what an entropy cone is, the holographic entropy cone is the same uh, for static space times as, as it is for time dependent space times. Um, or I, I, can, I can say it this way that the RT, the, um, uh, the HRT entropy cone is equal to the RT entropy cone. Okay, so that's, um, that's something new that you can do with, with Minimax, which I think is nice. Um, the rest of my talk was gonna be about bit threads and I'm just gonna scan through it and then I can answer questions. But um, what you do is you start from this, the Minimax and, min, and Maximin uh, formulas. Um, so, um, you know, well, basically in this form, ah, sorry, in this, you know, um, uh, um, Maximin and Minimax in this form, and then you apply convex relaxation to uh, to the space of slices and time sheets. So you have smeared slices, smeared time sheets, and you end up with this. Uh, and then you have to do something to make it all convex and con um, concave convex. So you get uh, a certain thing, which is basically a, a, the average area. 
Um, and then you know that you can switch the maximization and the minimization. Um, uh, and then you can dualize. And when you dualize on one variable, you get bit threads that are space-like. And when you dualize on the other variable, you get bit threads that are time-like. And so you define what we call a V-flow, um, which is a one form basically going across uh, from D of A to D of A complement. And you're maximizing the flux subject to a certain constraint and U flows where you, um, it's a time-like thing going from the past boundary to the future boundary. Um, and here you're minimizing the flux subject to a certain norm bound. Um, and um, uh, and th so this convex quantity that you have is sitting between these two in a general space time. But of course, in a holographic space time, this equals this, which means that, that the, the, the bit threads give the same uh, value. Um, uh, and then a picture of what the optimal flows look like. Um, so the optimal flows find the HRT surface, they find the entanglement wedges, and they basically squeeze through the HRT surface for the U flow in a space-like direction and in time-like direction for the V flows. Um, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about the bit threads. So that, that was just to give people a taste. I, didn't, I did not explain any of that properly. So uh, that's what I had to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. So it's time for questions. There is also already huh? please, some data. Please, could you ask a question? Yeah, so is there a sort of given socking kind of derivation for the HRT formula? Um, well, so, um, yeah, I think using sort of something like the Lefkowitz Maldacena derivation yeah. of RT but using a, a, a Lorentzian path integral. Um, so um, I'm probably going to get cite the, the authors wrong. Tadashi, maybe you can help me. I think it Lefkowitz and Rangamani. Yeah. And um, who else was on that? Oh, Dong, yeah. Yeah, so uh, my question is, in general, if you have some scalar coupled to the gravity, then if you integrate out, uh, so, so in general, I would, I would suppose that it involves a one loop calculation, right? You uh, integrate out the scalars and then you get some sort of gravity path integral and then you get the free energy from there and the, from there you get the entropy, right? That, that, that's the general sort of thing, right? Well, I, I don't think if you're just interested in the classical piece, then you, you don't have to integrate out the scalars. Um, now, of course, if you want the quantum piece, like deriving the quantum extremal surface, then yes, what you do is you integrate every, all the matter out, actually. Um, and that, that gives you the quantum extremal surface formula. Yeah, and in, in such a formula, uh, if you have a, for, for instance, if you have a vacuum expression value for the scalar, which you can have in, in a generic case. Mm -hmm. so, so in general, the effective action for the scalar would involve that sort of vacuum effective action. Uh, I mean, so that vacuum expectation value, mm -hmm. right? So shouldn't that sort of term also uh, kind of figure in the formula for the entropy, uh, for the, in the HRT formula, when you minimize the, when you, minimize the uh, effective action and get the free energy and from there get the entropy. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, you would, you would certainly, so if, if the scalar has a VEV and, I mean, you, you can even be much more general than that. You can consider, um, uh, you know, matter which is back reacting. So there's nothing that is here that is saying that it, it has to be a vacuum solution. Um, so the HRT formula is, is valid in, in the presence of classical matter, which has a classical back reaction. Um, and uh, so, it, and it doesn't have, yeah, it doesn't have to be the ground state or anything like that. 
Yeah, so so the question is, uh, in, in that case, doesn't it invalidate the HRT formula? No, 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 the, the HRT formula knows about, because it, the HRT formula knows the geometry, which includes any back reaction that might be happening from, if you have a, if you have a scalar condensate, even a time dependent, you know, scalar profile or something. Um, if it's back reacting, then you are supposed to find the extremal surface um, in that in that classical background. So it takes into account via the back reaction, you know, whatever matter you have. Now, if you want the quantum corrections, um, you know, because the matter also has fluctuations, therefore contributes at a quantum level to the entropy, then then you would need to use the quantum extremal surface formula, and that would take into account um, also the entanglement of the scalar fields, the entanglement of the graviton, anything else you've got going on. But in general, you do have the quantum corrections, right? How can you ignore the quantum corrections? Well, I mean, you can be in a regime where those are, where those are, you know, subleading, right? I mean, just like same as with black hole entropy. I mean, you can, um, uh, it, unless you are considering sort of, you know, a, you know, things get very interesting, obviously, when the quantum corrections are not small compared to the classical piece. And that's what happens with an old black hole. And that's how you get the page curve out of quantum extremal surfaces. But if you have a young black hole, you know, the, the, the quantum corrections will be very small compared to the classical piece. So you, you have a well-controlled approximation. Um, you know, working in the classical limit is, uh, is a, is a well-controlled approximation there. And also there are the, there are the quartic di divergent terms and the quadratic divergent terms, which come from the, in general, from this, uh, this David Seeley uh, expansion of the effective action, uh, uh, because you have this ds by s to the cube terms times some coefficient, uh, which also figures, I, I never understood why those kinds of terms are renormalized away or something, because uh, can you explain why they're kind of, ignored? Well, I mean, in principle, um, okay, so, you know, if, if you're, if you're using the full quantum extremal surface formula, then you should, then you're supposed to know everything about the entropy of your quantum fields, even if they're, you know, interacting and whatever, or they could even be strongly coupled. I mean, that's what happens in, in double holography is that the quantum fields on uh, propagating on some um, space time are themselves holographic and described by a second layer of holography. So those are strong, that's some strongly coupled CFT, which is coupled to gravity. So when you apply the quantum extremal surface formula, you're, you know, um, uh, in principle, you're supposed to know uh, the entropy um, of the quantum fields, you know, to all orders or exactly. Um, uh, you can do, you, if you're a little less ambitious, you can just, and you're in a regime where the quantum corrections are small, um, then you can, you, you can just um, approximate your quantum fields as being free. That'll give you an approximation to the, you know, to the full entanglement entropy. If you have some weakly coupled quantum fields. So that gives you what's called the FLM, Faulkner, Lefkowitz, Maldesena formula. Where, where, which is just a perturbative formula. In general, when you integrate out a scalar, in general, uh, you just get uh, log of p square plus m square integrated over p, right? Uh, for the uh, for the effective action, right? So when you when you when you impose a cutoff, uh, that sort of gives you a quartic divergence. So why why aren't those sorts of terms also uh, uh, I mean, relevant here because when you have a uh, when you have a scalar coupled to a gravity, and you integrate out the scalar, then you you would in general have those those sorts of terms, and in 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 the presence of a metric, those sorts of terms would uh, be proportional to the root g, and uh, they would have some uh, quartic divergence. So in general, uh, when, when you are considering the uh, HRT formula, those sorts of terms should also be relevant. So why are, why are they ignored in general? 
that's that's my question. No, they're not they're not ignored. I mean, they're if they're in your effective action and they're contributing, then they will contribute, as you say, to the entropy. So they're 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 contained in the in the in the matter. So the, the quantum extremal surface formula has two terms. It has an area term and it has the matter entropy term. So you're talking and, about and, the matter and, entropy term. And the power so divergence piece is absorbed into the area. That's it. Area well, then I mean, th well, that's a separate thing. So you know, to the extent that you, so for any fixed cutoff, you know, you need a regulator for your matter fields um, and um, uh, they will, uh, you know, so there'll be an area term and then there'll be a, a, a matter entropy term. Now, then there's the question of what happens if you change the cutoff and what happens is that both of those terms change in such a way that the sum of them changes. And um, that that is something that has been proven. It works. I, I think you know it works for free fields. I'm not sure to what extent it's been proven that it works perturbatively, but everyone expects that it would work perturbatively. I mean, there may be some things left to do that have not been completely cleaned up there, but I think the expectation is that you know in perturbation theory, um, uh, you know the 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 renormalization of Newton's constant would absorb. Uh, changes in the in the quantum term, but that's the same issue, right? If you, you see, if you see power divergence from matter sector, and the most dominant piece you regard as an area, yeah. So then the rest is subdominant almost by definition. So uh, that's why you can ignore in a regime that long range uh, entanglement is smaller than this short range uh, entanglement. Right. That's the regime you're working on. So it's yeah. just yeah, it's just not. Um, so I have uh, actually one uh, technical question. I just probably didn't get a precise statement of your uh, dilemma you uh, said to be crucial for your result. And this is just literally the question. You said um, you have a choice of say tau BC in such a way that the gamma one of AB is already maximum in that portion. Uh, uh, when you say maximum, uh, what are you doing on the end point of gamma way a gamma one a b, which is on tau b c? Is that a fixed? It's end? free. It's a free. So you're saying that uh, the, there is a choice of some tau uh, b c in such a way that even if you don't use a condition that gamma one a b and gamma two a, a b are uh, connected, even if you don't use that condition, it will reproduce same uh, uh, connected curve. Exactly. And you, you, okay, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to understand this thing. Yeah, if you, it, it's, it's not actually an unreasonable thing. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit easier to picture it, if we just talk about a Riemannian metric and minimal surfaces uh, rather than maximal surfaces in a, Lorentzian one, mm -hmm. but you can actually convince yourself heuristically that it's true, um, that you can kind of, what, what you do is you, you know, you, you adjust the cutting place in such a way that even the minimal surfaces will yeah. automatically line up, even yeah. though you're not putting that in as a condition. Yeah. I'm not questioning about, I mean, I just wanted to, you know, get the statement correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Ah, so I have two questions. So your formulation, this mean max proof of this entropy co coin is very beautiful. And then uh, I just, uh, this is my question. So what's the difference between, I mean, man, a max mean procedure this Alan was, why the mean max is big, uh, proof of mean max is very close to static case. Is that because minim minimization is later? Um, yeah, just heuristically. I, I, just, I don't, I mean, I, I know the technical answer to that question, but I don't know the um, like the intuitive answer. I mean, the, at, at a technical level, what goes wrong with, um, with the maximin um, when you talk about the higher entropy inequality? So let me just, um, I, I, they're actually pretty complicated and I don't actually know the full formula, I mean, if I thought about it, maybe I could, um, yeah, I mean, it's something like this. So uh, on the right-hand side, you you have stuff like this. Uh, 
and a lot of a lot more stuff like that. Um, when you prove it using Maximin, you need you you take all the things on the left hand side, all of those surfaces, and you project them onto the slice that you use to calculate the things on the right hand side. But the problem is these surfaces on the right hand side are not on a common slice. Oh. So there, there is no slice to on, onto which you can project everything on the left hand side. Um, uh, and the reason is that these things already cross. Crossing means partially overlapping. So A, B, and B, C partially overlap. And when you have crossing, there's no common maximum slice. Unlike when you have nesting, so like in, 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 um, uh, in MMI, uh, let me write. So the, the, the next most complicated, um, So here you see the left-hand side crosses, but the right-hand side doesn't cross. So there exists a, um, a single slice on which all of the extremal surfaces, all four of these lie. And so you can project you know, these surfaces, even though these surfaces don't lie on a common slice and they don't lie on the same slice as these surfaces, you can project each of these onto the slice that you use for these surfaces. Um, but when you get to the higher inequalities, it fails. So um, that's a technical answer to your question. Um, I, 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 I wish I understood better why any of these proofs work or don't work. I mean, I think at some level, we're missing something about the RT and HRT formulas because all of these entropy inequalities um, have, you know, in the RT case, they have such simple proofs. The fact that they have such simple proofs must reflect the fact that the state is somehow very simple, right, compared to a general quantum state. And um, we don't have, we don't have any understanding of that simplicity. Hmm. Also, so yeah, another question. So, so this uh, time-like formulation, time-like surface formulation, is, is that also used? So, uh, because your final part is very quick, so is that also useful for bit spread construction when you well, quantize it, bit threads? Yeah, it's kind of what leads to the time-like threads. So. Um, so what you one way to get to the covariant bit threads is if you start with maximin and then on a slice, instead of looking for the minimal surface, you look for the max flow. Now that flow is confined to a slice, but then you can you can sum, you can sum over slices. Okay, you can smear out the slice. And that gives you the the V threads. Um, so you can think of this as, as a bunch of uh, flows, each of which is confined to some slice, and then you smear out the slice. Similarly, on the time sheet, you can put a time like a vector field on a time sheet, and then you can you can smear out over the time sheets, and that gives you the U flows. So it, that's the connection. So space like flow looks like um, some entanglement network. Yeah. As usually, tensor network, but time like one, do you have any understanding in terms of entanglement or on such? I mean, I think it's in a way it, it's it's um you can think of it as like some kind of a barrier, like what these U threads are doing, they are um they're they're forming a barrier which is analogous to the RT surface. Um, so, um, so you have these sort of, yeah, the, these, these two complementary viewpoints in one of which you're, um, you're, you're, you're 
maximizing the amount of entanglement you can find in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the other one, your um, uh, your there's some kind of a uh, some kind of procedure where you're um, yeah reducing um, you're you're kind of asking like um, what's the least you need to do to separate the two like how how what's the minimum number of cuts you need to do in a network to separate the two um. boundaries. Um, and these, so these things, they're kind of, they're somehow like things that remove entanglement. And you're asking, well, what's the fewest such that you've removed all the entanglement? It's very, this is very like vague, uh, you know, um, so I don't, I, I don't have a really good, um, I don't have a really sharp answer, but I think at some level that that must be what's going on. So is it related to some time-like area? Of course, it's entropy is usually related to space-like area, but uh, Well, in the end, it's it's a it's a space like area, um, uh, because what happens, like in the when you actually go to optimize, is that all of these things are going through the HRT mm -hmm. surface. I see, I see, I see, I see. And so the number of them actually equals the area of the HRT surface. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Both are related to this area of minimums, okay. extremes. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other question? I, I have a follow-up question to what I was saying. Uh, so uh, the, the understanding is that, that the qu quadratic divergence is proportional to the uh, uh, Ricci scalar, and that would be in general be absorbed in the G Newton and give rise to the uh, area law from the Gibbons Hawking kind of analysis, but there's still the quartic divergence which can't give rise to an area law. I mean, it can't give rise to an area in the same sense as the uh, Ricci scalar term. So, uh, so that okay. That so, term, so it, so what it does is it gives rise to, as you say, a sort of higher curvature terms in the in the gravitational effective action, and in principle, one does need to take those into account. So for that, you have to go, you, basically you're going beyond Einstein gravity. So your effective action has terms beyond just the Ricci scalar. And so then there are corrections that were written down by Shi Dong um, based on work by Wald. Uh, so in, in the black hole entropy case, this, you know, you have to use the Wald formula for black hole entropy, which takes into account higher curvature corrections generated by integrating matter out. Um, and um, you basically have to do something similar with the entanglement entropy. So you're right, you're right that those terms are there in the effective action if you integrate out some matter and they change the HRT formula. The higher order corrections are usually the log terms, but what I'm talking about is a quartic divergent term, which is proportional to the cosmological constant. It's just proportional to root G. But it has a quartic, it's quartically divergent coming from the Schwinger parameter when you cut it off at some epsilon. And you, you are integrating over ds over s cubed. It comes in the, uh, in the uh, divot kind of effective action uh, when, you, uh, when you do it by the heat kernel approach. So well, that sort of term wouldn't give rise to any kind of area or something. It, it, it's just a quartic divergent term and it would give rise to some sort of energy free energy from which if you calculate the entropy, it's going to give rise to some divergent term. Well, it's going to give rise to all of these kinds of terms in the, the renorm yeah, it's going to renormalize the cosmological constant as well as the um, uh, Newton constant and the higher curvature stuff. So, um, so yeah, it'll renormalize the cosmological constant and that's, 
you know, that um, will, that'll, you know, uh, adjust the background. But then if you have the vacuum expectation value of some scalar, it would give rise to the sort of terms that you have in this sort of KKLT picture, right? And if you want to incorporate that entire thing here, you would have to make a sort of analysis that is tantamount to the KKLT picture instead of just naively assuming that uh, the cosmological constant gets renormalized or things of that. That's I mean, if we, so basically fix your regulator, now you have an effective action, pure matter and, 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 your, and your metric, okay? If you just fix your regulator, uh, then and and assuming that your effective action now is is closely approximated by Einstein gravity with a cosmological constant, you know, then you go ahead and you use HRT. So as long as the effective action is a good approximation, you're in a regime where the effective action is a good approximation in your space time. You can use the HRT formula. So I, you know, if yeah, I don't think there's too much more to be said about that. So oh, I think it's a good time to close this session. And uh, let's move. Uh, if you want to discuss, please go to the special chat, which I just uh, put in a uh, chat of this Zoom. So you can just click there, then you can go to already few people are there. Okay, so okay, thank you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you.